Hey, hi, I'm Bruce Benefield, and welcome to this week's edition of One World. Hi, and welcome back. Uh, namaste, of course, simply means I worship that which is within you, or the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. But just imagine what can be created in the world around you if you would greet everyone, even with that single thought in your mind. It'd be pretty awesome, I think. This week's guest is Thea Alexander, who's author of many books. One in specific is 2150 A.D., and she's got some very interesting perspectives uh, from a micro, or micro and macro cosmic viewpoint that I think you'll really enjoy listening to. Thea, welcome. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here in your energy. Oh, thank you. Uh, now, 2150, that, if we can talk about that a little bit, if you could synopsize the book. I, I think it would be much easier for you than, than I uh, because it does bring about some very interesting perspectives that I, for one, also feel that we're headed towards in the future. If you could elaborate on that just a little. Okay. Uh, 2150 was really written for the purpose of introducing to people the fact that they have a choice. It was written to, to demonstrate through the characters that in every moment that we live, we make decisions and that we exactly. have the right to make those decisions. And um, among other things, that, that we have a potential that we're aware of from a macro perspective. But from a micro perspective, we have fear rather right. than the courage to pursue that which we know we, we are able to do. And so the book was really written to give people permission to be that which they have the potential to be, to reach for the gold ring. Um, it was to show them characters who could live as the, as the average person would really like to live, which is right. according to their real deep beliefs. And then, given that we're able to do that, once the time comes as we evolve, um, when we get to the point where we're able to do that, then we won't elect people anymore to office. Um, but because they paid X amount of dollars for advertising, right. but rather because they've demonstrated the values of love, wisdom, and leadership. And once they are, are able to live this, then their world is, is so um, attractive. And enhanced. And yes, that, that people want to be like them and pattern themselves after them. So. 2150 was originally written to create role models for young people, for old people, for whoever feels that there's something a little further than today, something a little less uh, frightening, a little less um, the same as everybody else, right. and still honorable. Um, that's a little bit okay. of what it's about. Uh, uh, what prompted that as far as what was going on inside of you and the people around you at the time? Well, I was practicing as a counseling psychologist at the time. Okay. And um, that was many years ago. And I, I was always very aware of young people, having started my career as a psychologist in a prep school for girls. And these young girls were... <laughs> I'll bet it would be for you. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> Particularly for you. <laughs> well, they're so beautiful, and they have such high ideals and such promise, but they have a lot of fear as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I always felt that if I could show young people um, a, a way of life, a way of making decisions and honoring themselves as they did so, that um, they, could, they could free themselves 
and only by freeing themselves can they then become what they have the potential to be. And as they do that, individuals do that, then groups will do it. And as the groups do it, countries will do it, and ultimately the world will be united as one. One Mac world? One world. What a novel is. idea. <laughs> 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 and I call that a macro society right. um, because if you, just to illustrate what micro and macro mean to me, okay. that if you have a micro perspective, it would be um, making mountains out of molehills. Fear-based, basically. Yes. You, you look through a microscope. Fear-based process. Yeah. You see the world at, it, like this, mm -hmm. like a horse with blinders on, and you don't want the horse to be frightened, which is why you put the blinders on. I believe that people put blinders on themselves for exactly the same reason. Oh, sure. To block out the I things. I don't want to know. I don't want to see. I don't want to hear. Yeah. You know, just give me this, this, and this, and I'll be okay. And the more that prevails, the tighter they get and the, the narrower the perspective mm -hmm. till suddenly instead of seeing a whole bouquet of roses, you're only seeing one rose, and then it gets a little narrower and all you see is the thorn. Mm -hmm. So you think the world is made up of thorns. Now there's a part of you that always knows better. But so long as you keep your sight squeezed in real tightly, you can't see it. Right. So I try to help people know that they have the opportunity and they have the right to pull these blinders out and see a macrocosmic view rather than a microscopic view where they can see not only the rose bush the bouquet of roses, but the whole field of roses and the world beyond that. Mm -hmm. And the oneness of all that is and the beauty of all that is, right. rather than the fear, so that they can see one another as one and acknowledge that. In going through that, were there things that, I mean, we, we think about that, that process and removing the, the blinders what kind of how-to's came up as far as being able to to get through that um, or did you begin to see that when you were um, working at the school or, or I tried to figure a way a, a tool mm -hmm. to slip under the doors when you <laughs> pardon me this may not An be envelope true full of shaving cream with a <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> this may not be true of all teenagers right. but for many teenagers if it comes out of the mouth of anyone over 20 it, do it doesn't have value they are going through a time in their life when when it's necessary for them to rebel it's necessary sure. for them right. to explore necessary for them to question necessary for them to disagree and in learning to honor themselves and trust themselves and trust their own judgment, they need to set other judgments, keep other people's judgments aside. So I was already past 20 by the time I got around to writing. And I therefore knew I needed a tool besides words. Sure. So I chose science fiction and wove the philosophy, a macro philosophy, into a science fiction book. Fortunately for me, it became a classic. People liked it a lot. And I did slip it under the door. A lot of people buy it as science fiction. Uh, grandmothers give it to their grandchildren. Grandchildren give it to their grandmothers. And they can do that because it's a fiction. It's a story. And it doesn't have to threaten anybody. However, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you really read the book, I mean, for me, as I read anything, um, you know, as sensitive, we, we talked about being a cancer and the, and the sensitivity. Yes. Uh, I become what I read, and especially if I'm interested in the processes that are contained therein, I mm -hmm. really go into the depths of my own being and play those concepts off where I'm at and what I want to dream, what I want to be in that dream, mm -hmm. and how to make that dream real. Exactly. And the books seem to be a way of expressing that for the characters um, and that in turn you know open things up for me now when you get into something like that you're opening up a door for a lot of people that can tend to set them off hopefully so to speak. yeah hopefully um, 
hopefully it, it will open a door that while it may have some fears, while there may be some concerns sure. about stepping forward and wearing a jacket like you're wearing today. I mean, would a plain old frightened person be doing that? No way. I mean, you have to have the courage to experience. Now, I gave people permission in this book, through my characters, to take that adventure, to be different if they wanted to be different mm -hmm. than the person next to them and still know that they're not bad for doing that. And they gave them permission to make mistakes. Right. Knowing that, that... How often do we do that? How often do we give ourselves the opportunity to make mistakes? Not often enough. You know, I, I heard you asking someone once, uh, what, what uh, bit of information, what advice would you give if you could only give one bit of advice? And as I watched that, I thought, oh, if you could only give one bit of advice, what would it be? What would it be, Thea? And the answer came up, and I said, Go ahead. Go ahead, ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to save that for later. <laughs> and, well, I said to myself, I think that it would probably be a, a, a toss-up between understanding and acknowledging and really coming to a point where you realize that absolutely everything is perfect enough for today, right. including ourself, and that there is no growth without what we typically call mistakes, what sure. we typically call failure. Sure. You cannot walk through life and not fail at things along the way. Like you say, the, the failures, the mistakes, those are the true teachers. Yeah. The more you fail, we should teach our children to pursue failure. Yeah. We should give them a, a gold star when they fail yeah. because it's only then that they see what they can do next. You can't w drive down the street without deviating a little bit to the right and the left, and your steering wheel helps you have a tool to stay between the lines. Right. But you are constantly correcting, yet we don't teach our children that life is a process of constant corrections. We teach them, if you get one wheel too close to that line, you're bad. You mustn't do that. And how stifling that is. What a crime we commit against our children. Instead of asking, or when a child asks, hey, can I do that? Instead of saying, no, you can't do that. I don't know. Try it and find out. Yes. See if you can. Yes. I mean, that's how I overcame a lot of things. A lot of times I would go out and do something and then I'd start asking questions <laughs> afterwards. I'd, hey, yeah. can you do that? No, you can't do that. Well, I just did. How did I do it if you can't do it? Yeah. What, a, you know, what mistake did I make <laughs> yes. that allowed me to do it? Well, macro philosophy, um, what I call the belief system uh, that I've written the other books around as well, mm -hmm. uh, macro philosophy holds that there is no such thing as a mistake. There are only opportunities to grow. Right. And that by living through what we commonly term as mistakes, and by seeking in them the blessing, by seeking in them the thing that you can enhance your life with, you can have a whole great big pile of great things as a result of a few mistakes. Right. Some of the, sometimes those mistakes can be quite fun, too. Well, they're frightening. Uh, they're sometimes frightening. Oh, you bet. Yeah, they can be fun. True. Uh, True. I always like to take the, the macro view. <laughs> yeah. Now, how do you see what you've initiated or instigated um, with the, the book? How do you see that being reflected back to you in, in the world around you, in your immediate surroundings? Well, I have a lot of good feedback. I've had over a quarter million letters from people who've read my books. Yes. <laughs> and, it, and they tell me how it works and what it does in their life. Um, I tell you several stories. One, let me tell you a story. Okay, yeah, One of them that, I'd love to. that just um, makes me feel like what I do has been worthwhile. Um, I, I hear those words a lot. It's changed my life. I bought it as a science fiction, but it's changed my life. And this one woman called, um, excuse me, wrote, and um, 
she wanted a copy of 2150 for her daughter. And having given that to her daughter, about three months later, I heard from the daughter. And I, I was thinking about earlier conversations and that we have we've had here and about the oneness of all and about how everything happens in its own perfect time and space right. and how you don't read a book by accident, you don't meet someone by accident, you don't cross the street by accident, nothing in your life is by accident. Okay, this woman ordered the book for her daughter, gave it to her daughter, and three months later the daughter wrote me to say thank you for saving my life. And I read on to see what in the world does she mean? I have a daughter who's an RN, but I never saved anybody's life that I know of. And she said, my husband and I and our five-year-old son took a trip to the West Coast. And we were all fascinated by the Pacific Ocean, never having experienced an ocean before. And the little boy enjoyed it so much that when it was time to leave, he wanted to say goodbye to the ocean. So my husband pulled over picked up our son, left the engine running, walked to the edge of the cliff, and they waved goodbye to the ocean, and as they did so, the, cave, the cliff fell away below them, and they both fell to their death. I would have died at that instant myself. I would have followed them if I had not read 2150 just the week before. She said, this happened 10 days after Mother gave me the book. And so how do I see it manifesting? I see people having a different frame of reference mm -hmm. once they are familiar with the fact that they have a choice, once they're familiar with the fact that they have chosen this life for a purpose. This young lady knew, well, at least she'd Somehow. been exposed to the possibility right. through reading uh, macro philosophy. Um, she'd been exposed to the possibility that there was a purpose in this. She'd been exposed to the possibility that it was perfect for its time and space. She'd been exposed... She just had to figure out how. <laughs> yes, yes, and that's yeah. what we all have to do is exactly. figure out how. That's the challenge. For her, fortunately, she was able to grab into her mind and, and find this broader perspective which had meaning, which gave meaning to a life which went on without her husband and her young son. Right. Um, so that's so, a tremendous amount of, of emotion to be jerked away. Yes, yes. And I, mean, I, I mean, don't know how second. you think about it, Bruce, but I think that every person has an essential essence that is energy. Sure. And that the physical body is simply a tool that we use, much the same as I drive a car. And it really doesn't matter what that looks like. It's not a belief for me. It, it's a knowledge. I've had experiences throughout my life where I've actually had people who I've known that have passed on yeah. return. And it was real enough for me. I don't care what anybody else says. Uh, so much so one evening that the, the bed actually moved from the physicality. You know, the body loses, what, 46 ounces of weight yes. immediately upon cessation of life. Well, that weight has mass, be it the soul, the spirit, what, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm it has mass, therefore it has form. So it, it is there, and it has been quantifiably proven. Uh, well, I have a really strong belief that this energy field that you and I are merging right now, mm -hmm. that once someone is a part of your life, and you accept them and value them, accept them into your life, like a husband, a wife, a child, that their energy field merges so much with yours that when they die, when they leave the physical space and withdraw their energy, you have a great gap mm -hmm. in your energy field. Sure. And it takes time for that to heal. And you can sit here having a great philosophy of life, crying very much at the loss of a loved one, and still know on one level of your mind and of your emotion that it's perfect for its time and space, that it's a part of their growth, a oh, part sure. of their evolutionary experience, and a part of your own. Well, I've got a similar, didn't happen through a death, but I went through a divorce several years ago. I've got four children. Oh, my. And those were, were taken away. Yeah, there was a great part of me taken away for a while. And yes. I became very despondent because of that until I learned how to feel it, how to, to feel it, yes. and how to fill it creatively. Mm -hmm. um, and accept that, yes, that, that was the perfect thing to happen at that time, and my children are learning exactly what they need to know, 
even if it's without me right now, mm -hmm. because they're really not without me. We're still connected, even though that we're not physically together. Exactly. And you probably dream of them, and I know that they dream of you. Sure. And My oldest daughter and I could communicate telepathically since she was two years old, and she's 12 now. So, okay. yeah. That's very, very nice, um, positive reinforcement for the things that, that I have taught for years, that in 2150, communication is telepathic. Right. And we're increasingly growing toward that. Agreed. I mean, I've, I've been aware of it since a, a, a teenager, probably much younger than that, had if I really looked. Yeah. But uh, to the point where I could actually use it to communicate with people and mm -hmm. others with me. Um, so I know that, that that is there. Now, on the flip side of it, it can also be used by those who understand it to the point to actually manipulate others and, and control them. That scared me because I saw how I could do that and was in some cases. How you could misuse this gift. Exactly. So I, I stepped back at that point because I didn't feel like I had the wisdom to use it. Back to love, wisdom, and leadership. Exactly. Um, let me suggest okay. that you cannot manipulate anyone without their cooperation. Sure. Okay. I know that now. Yes. I didn't then. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I don't feel right within myself if I'm manipulating somebody else. I feel that I'm dishonoring myself. You bet. Because they are me. From a macro perspective, we sure. are all really one. We're interconnected. Um, another, uh, another discussion that I observed you having once was had to do with the connectedness of all that is and how thoughts permeate the universe mm -hmm. and how different things, different inventions occur simultaneously in three or four different parts of the world. And where if you watch a uh, soap opera, it'll have the theme of maybe um, of earthquakes. There's an earthquake in the soap opera, and that night there's a movie on with earthquakes. And the next day you're reading a newspaper article, it has to do with earthquakes. And there's another play the next night, and it has to These common themes, I think they permeate the universe. Mm -hmm. And that, that we tune into them. A kind of fractalization of thoughts, yes, if you will. Yes, beautifully put. I love right. it. Oh, say that again. It's such a nice Fractalization point. of thoughts. Isn't that nice? Yeah, it is. It, <laughs> it tickles my mind to think it, that word. And to realize that that came from science, I mean, it, was, <laughs> it wasn't an arts or, or a, a, a humanities type thing or a literature. It came from the, the, the scientific realm and the paradigm, the new paradigm, the paradigm shift. Those are all scientific mm -hmm. terms that they're coming to, uh, to realize that science is really proving what the mystics or the macro uh, cosmic physicians uh, yeah have understood for a long time. We all really do have what is popularly known as ESP. Mm -hmm. Every one of us has it. And we use it to varying degrees. In 2150, I teach people about the natural use of their ESP. Well, I call it macro powers. Because from this perspective, from the micro view, right. we're frightened of them. Sure. They're from the devil. We uh, don't understand them. We're ignorant of them. Right. I think of my, my uh, husband's mother, when she was very young, she was very, very psychic. And she had a dream one night and woke up screaming when she was 9 or 10 years old, saying, the courthouse is burning down, the courthouse is burning down. And her parents said, oh, we have got to take her to see the minister. And they had her exercised. Well, the only thing was, that very night, the courthouse was burning down. And it, it, but they feared this kind of insight. I'm suggesting that we positively reinforce it, that when our children know things, see things, hear things, talk to discarnates, talk to energy essences which we don't perceive because we've taught ourselves we don't, right. to, to honor their perception. They are the new generation. Agreed. They are macro man. The perceptive abilities, too, seem to correlate or coincide with the ability to perceive a broader harmonic frequency range, if you will. We're limited yes. to the visible, visible light spectrum, or mm -hmm. most of us have chosen us to be limited to. Yes. Okay. Yes. These are much more expanded visionaries. They're, they feel more, they see more, they hear more. Mm -hmm. And I think even a lot of the schizophrenics 
that have been labeled such yes. uh, have these types of abilities that just simply aren't understood yet. Yes, and we call them bad and condemn them and say that they're sick because they perceive what we have not yet been, they perceive from here. Right. And we have not been willing to perceive beyond this point. And the, the idea of judging uh, gets us in trouble. Mm -hmm. And it stifles our own evolution. I find myself, for example, if I'm on the road doing lecture tours, workshop seminars, that type of thing, I don't have to have my mind concerned about is the vac has the vacuuming been done, uh, has the newspaper been read, do I have the groceries for next week's dinner party, da 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 da, all these earthly things. I don't have to be concerned with when I'm on the road. And I'm very, very psychic when I'm on the road. I'm very, very psychic. If there's danger, I perceive it. Mm -hmm. If there is joy, I perceive it. I sit down with a counselee and I perceive not only today but tomorrow and yesterday as well. I can talk to them about their previous lives. I can talk to them about their future lives as well as this one. Well, at home, I go back to this. Keeping the checkbook balanced, um, all the, being the things that a good wife is and that a good mother is and a good neighbor is. And, well, you've and got that microcos microcosmic business to take care of there, whereas yes. when you're out on the road, it's more of a macrocosmic type thing where you're operating on that level. Um, so if, if people can learn to free themselves from, from the humdrum concerns of daily life, right. the, to the extent that we're able to free ourselves, we will manifest telepathy, clairaudience, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, telekinesis, the movement of matter with your mind, all of these things are right here in the palm of our hand. And all we need to do is begin to acknowledge them, call them what they are, instead of saying you had a hunch when you pick up the phone and you knew who was there, smile deeply inside and say, thank you, macro self. Right. I am realizing my own power Great. and my connectedness with all that is, was, or ever will be. Thea, thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking with you, and I'm sure that our audience has got some new insights, and uh, hopefully you guys will begin testing out and acknowledging yourselves and trying to uh, tap, or tapping in, actually, to that macrocosmic self that you are. Thea, Nice again. being with you. Nice being with you, too. Okay. Please, if you've seen the show, give us a write or a call. Actually, it would be better. 602-264-0986. Or you can drop us a line if you'd like. Care of One World, PO Box 32035, Phoenix, Arizona, 85064. And let us know what your perspective of One World is and how you're living. I'm Bruce Benefield, also known as Zendor, the door to what is. Namaste.